today. Um, I'm going to welcome our guests. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for being here. Are there any re agenda revisions? I think we're going to be hiring one more uh, hiring approval for the small package. It's someone that's already been here for the one year now. Okay, that's so we'll just add that under five point. Yeah, it's just another person. I'll, I'll hand. I'll actually start that. You, right you now. have more. I have. I have the nom for me. Okay, Mark. We'll tell you more about Mark. We'll get to it. And um, hey, Karen. Thanks. And we do have a green team presentation. Yeah. I don't see them. <laughs> yeah. I think they rallied out. Actually, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Oh so, yeah. So they may come. Or they may come late. They may come late. They may not come. They may not come. All right. Hey, uh, all right, I just want to say I'm going to apologize. I'm going to put on my dad hat. Yep. Sometime shortly and go watch my daughter go to meet with one of her events and then I'll be back in. Bill's on call. <laughs> okay, uh, 1.3 is public comments. Would you like to make any comments? Sure. Um, so I am here again, once again, on the white table. And last at your last meeting, you agreed to consider the issue again, so I hope you are going to be doing that today. Um, and uh, I still feel pretty strongly that um, having an independent uh, person at the math table, not a, not a mix-up of the different teachers coming in. Um, and I I also I heard I heard some sort of through the grapevine that some. Um, the administration were unhappy about the decision of the board. And I guess I just want to say about that, that I hope you will keep an open mind. Um, that, you know, we come in here, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about how school boards operate, how administrations operate, um, but we come in here when, when there are concerns that we think are affecting us as parents, uh, for our kids. And I hope that, that you won't make a decision until you've heard all the information. So that's, that's what I, I'm really hoping for here. Um, whatever you decide, you know, don't assume an, don't assume an outcome, please. Um, and I think, I guess, I guess that's all I want to say at this point. Thank okay. you. Thanks. And if I could, I'm uh, Richard Smith. And um, first of all, I, I appreciate that, uh, Kari, like, you and I had a quick conversation, but the fact that the board doesn't want to be micromanaging the administration for all the reasons, good reasons uh, that, that are out there. Um, but I think um, occasionally, sometimes, it's good to hear that, you know, and I know there are lots of great teachers and so forth, but occasionally, sometimes it's good to hear from the folks saying, hey, this, is, this really is an important person. And, if the, and we know that the administration uh, has tough decisions to make, but we want to make it clear that this is, this is a, a, a special resource that we hope you'll think again about. And I understand the, the, the constraints you're working under, but, but uh, we think uh, that's our job as, as parents to come and make that plea to you guys, and hopefully you'll, you'll hear and understand that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Colin Michael Smith. I was a senior last year, and I used Jim pretty much as much as I could. I thought he was uh, one of the most important teachers for me. He was the only teacher I actually made a card for. When I was leaving, so that was anything. He was always like, he was always nice to have like the same face whenever I was going to the math to, to fix the math problem. And he made it. He didn't make it a much about like strictly learning everything you need to know. Just like boom, 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 and out. He was more like, oh, come on in, you know, joke around a little bit. Let's figure out the problem in this nice, calm environment and make you feel safe. And he was just perfect for so many people. I don't, I don't think I ever heard a bad word about Jim, and I don't think. Uh, the other math teachers could say that about themselves. Great, thank you. So, we don't appear to have a green team, so we'll see if anybody shows up. And right on, oh, I'm sorry, uh, approval of minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from April 3rd? Move it. Echo. And Karen, any comments? I had one um, at the bottom of the first page, which is page eight of the packet. 
There's a sentence that reads, Scott Thompson had asked under what circumstances would the board reverse an earlier decision regarding the budget? I recall Charlie asking that question. No, it was actually me. It was you? No. Okay. Charlie would have asked it if I hadn't asked it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Sorry you misremembered. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, abstain? Okay, so that passes. So we're going to move on to 3.2, this budget process. I asked um, that we add this to the agenda um, so that before we delve into the specifics of the white table, we give some thought to the process that we use and arrive at making these decisions. Um, so, so just as a reminder, back in November, December, Era, um, right after the initial meeting by the Finance Committee, uh, we got some information and, and we basically established our parameters, what we were looking for um, from this year's budget. And basically, I think the one parameter that we set explicitly was that it come in under 3% in terms of uh, expense increase. Knowing that we're probably going to see a reduction in students and that would mean a, a greater increase in terms of per, per pupil. Um, I think it, it was probably implicit, it certainly was in part of the um, resulting discussions of what impact would this have on student learning outcomes. But essentially we, we set that one parameter. Um, and, and then not being experts in education, we asked the administration to, to create a, a plan and budget that conforms to that. That's what we got back um, and we approved that and you know, sort of made our way until we started hearing from teachers, students, and, and parents that they, they um, weren't necessarily happy with part of our decision, asked us to reconsider, and that's where we are now. So I'd like us to, I guess it was your question that got me thinking about this, which is, under what circumstances would we reconsider this? And I didn't, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, we haven't done that. It's not been our practice for the six years I've been on the board. And so I've kind of struggled with how, how do we do that? And, it, and it, I've got three things I'd, like, I'd ask us to think about as we, as we go into this. One is um, if, the, if the criteria for the decision here is public support, teacher, student, parent, and I'm glad that that support exists. I, I think it's, I don't know Jim, but it sounds like it's really wonderful. Um, are we being fair to the other people in the other positions? because we didn't broadcast that they're being reduced. We didn't invite comment about them. If we got that kind of feedback, I don't know exactly what we'd do with it, but I, I just, I have a concern about that type of criteria. Um, and I, I just ask us to consider that. Secondly, I think we have to think very carefully about undermining the authority of our administrators, because we basically asked them for something, they provided it, and now we're reconsidering that. And so I want to be very careful that we're not setting them up to, uh, and, and future boards, to get pushback um, uh, if people don't like a decision. Um, but they, all they have to do is, is, is um, you know, push back and, and then the board will reconsider. And what is, that puts our administrators in a challenging position, potentially, I think. So really carefully think about that. And the third thing um, I think that we should think about is that I don't think that this is a question of if this position will be reduced, it's more of a question of when. Given the trends that the student um, or the school is facing, we're going to see reductions over time. And um, you know, if we're going to you know, accomplish our top priority of preserving classroom teachers, this is the kind of position that we're going to have to look at in the future. So, I think one of the things that we might want to think about is asking the administration for a longer term plan uh, that we would get to review and, and potentially approve that will provide context for these decisions in the future so that we have an understanding of how is this going to happen? How is this reduction in expenses, personnel expenses and other expenses going to happen over time? Because this is a multi-year process that we're a part of. And I hate to see us sort of making the decisions, you know, in a herky-jerky sort of, you know, one year at a time fashion, um, if we can avoid that. So I think that's something that we, we might want to think about 
um, at pre-conclusive process is, is asking for something that's, that provides that, that longer term context. So those are my thoughts, and I'm going to open it up for discussion. Other people want to talk about the process um, before we get into the specifics. Perhaps we should also, I mean, if we're talking, you introduced your three considerations, all of which I think are, are sound. Um, with reference to the expenditures, so perhaps as part of this process also would be useful to know is how much Jim and the white table with Jim costs. Um, the other, it, it's a strange sort of um, situation we find ourselves in. Right? Carl, last time, Carl, you were talking about um, we should that this is about positions, not about individual people. Yeah. Um, and I think, in a sense, it, that's true. But in the reality of the life of the school and the, um, how you know student learning, the individual turns out to be pretty significant. Um, so I guess we have to we have to kind of straddle that um, you know that dilemma of um, position versus person or position and person <coughs> together. Um, and then of course just student learning. You know the, the um, if I think the value of this position person or person position or whatever kind of amalgam we were talking about, um, the value of, of that for um, kids actually learning math. And, um, not, <coughs> and not just learning it to do well in the test, but learning it to for life in a way, so as not to be mathophobic experience. In relation to what you both said, I, what I heard you say, Carrie, um, Curry. Curry, geez, that's a, yeah, after you already corrected me once, I apologize. Um, I see what, I, I get your point about um, certain support in the admin. Um, I was pretty moved by the support of the students, and I'm eager not to uh, put a damper on that. But it is a funny issue, isn't it? On the one hand, we sort of have, a, uh, for lack of a better word, populism. You know, the force of a lot of people getting the better behind one idea and pushing it hard to uh, uh, to forward their goal. And the other is the role of, of people who are trying to balance that against other interests that may not be as well organized or as vocal, or, or both. But at this point, keeping an open mind, at this point, I feel as though the support of the students trumps the other considerations because I really feel strong. I feel that uh, I feel that uh, we're seeing that uh, I feel that there's a danger that we create a sense of futility or cynicism amongst uh, students if they don't feel that they can have some influence on the choice of. But they've got, that's got to be constraints. Mm -hmm. So I hear you loudly and clearly, but that's sort of where that I'm leaning now. And, and maybe that's where that longer term plan can, can come to bear. Yeah. Um, if the students have to par participate in creating that plan, maybe? Or yeah, yeah. Why are these buy in? Yeah. Other thoughts? So I agree with everything, everything you said, Kari. My question is so what about that parent who's paying for the chemistry tutor or the physics tutor or the foreign language? You know, I, I mean, how does that come into play? You know, we, there, there is no white table for the chem tutor or, or the sciences or for the foreign languages or for the arts or for any of that, for, you know, English. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, it, it is a matter of, of when. You know, when is this going to happen? You know, when are we going to hit a population balance where we're going to say, wow, we didn't need that big fancy track out there? <laughs> I mean, because, you know, the kids are actually participating in, in cross country or you know the gym class is so small that they could you know use another facility I, I, 
So, I mean, we were given a, a, a task, and, and that was to, you know, come up with a budget that worked. And I think we agreed on that budget. And we said it worked. All right, um, so maybe we should shift into the next topic, which is getting more into the specifics. What, what um, we approved last time, I believe, was asking the administration to present a more detailed plan of how the function would be fulfilled without the, that position. So the, the model that we're following is similar to the model that the English department has done for the past uh, two years. Um, so the English department is teaching four classes and then they're conferencing with kids um, for the fifth. So every teacher is contracted really to teach five of the eight blocks that we have. Um, we also have a provision in their contract where they can teach an additional assignment for one semester called the sixth assignment. Um, and so with the, the English department what we had worked is that they would do four classes which was the same number of kids that they were teaching in the five, um, but that we use that extra time to conference with kids more individually or, or small group. They're usually no more than two, is what I've seen. Um, so we looked at that same model for the math department. So our math department reduced the number of, of, cor of courses that they teach, sections that they teach, not courses, but sections that they teach. So the, most of our math teachers are going to be teaching four classes next year, and then their remaining time is going to be used to staff the white table and to meet with their own kids. And so, um, so the way that breaks down um, is that six of the eight blocks would be able to be covered by the teachers that are there. That's the equivalent of 1.6 teachers, so 1.6 FTEs, um, to cover the math white table. In addition to that, the math department already does um, two full positions worth of interventions in the middle school and um, algebra and geometry classes. So we have, when we, when we talk about the commitment of our math teachers to interventions, we're talking about uh, 3.6 FTEs is what we commit already to those interventions. Um, so those teachers would be, you know, each semester, the, the schedule would change a little bit from semester to semester, but the way it's, we've got it planned for right now is that the same teacher would be there the same block for an entire semester. So say the third block on Blue Day, I don't know which teacher that is, but there would be one teacher that would be there all semester on that day. And the same for all but uh, two of the blocks during those times. Um, they're looking at those two blocks as being, um, one of them is uh, when all of the, there's three Algebra two classes, which is the highest use of the white table this year or by Algebra two students. Um, there are three classes during one of those blocks. They feel like being at the white table during that block doesn't make a whole lot of sense when 50, over 50% 50 of the kids who come would be in class. So that was one that would seem reasonable. Um, and then the other one was the lowest usage time is block one. And so they were looking at that as well as being the two that they wouldn't cover um, during the time. Um, I would say that you know, when we think about departments as a whole, the math department has the most uh, FTEs of any department. It's 10.6. Um, the English or literacy is 10 FTEs. Science is 10. Uh, global studies is 8.6, and world languages is 5.4. And then special education is 10, and VAPA is 7.8 when you look at our numbers across the school. So those are the number of teachers that we have in each of those departments. Um, I would say that's, these are some of the things we looked at. Um, you know, if, we, if, you, if you were to say that we should staff the white table with somebody other than the current math faculty, then we are overstaffed in our math department because every one of those teachers that's teaching four should go to five because that, they wouldn't have that assignment contractually and then we, we should reduce the number of math teachers that we have. Um, so we would essentially be eliminating a, I, well, in this case we would be eliminating a newer math teacher with that, um, for a retired uh, math teacher to staff the white table. 
I mean, that, I mean, that's kind of how we looked at it. We looked at the model that was working for English and that our Roland Fellow, Alden Bird, has really been working with a lot of our teachers around is the idea that we conference with kids, that we don't just, we don't just have just a drop-in kind of model, but that we actually schedule time with kids outside of class who need support. Um, for our math department, the freshman and sophomore math classes don't need that because they already have the students who need support the majority of students who need support already have an algebra lab or a geometry lab, so they already have the teacher um, for two math blocks, essentially, uh, during, the, during the course of the eight blocks. And so um, when we look at how much intervention we provide for reading and how much we provide for math, they're pretty evenly split until you throw in the math white table, and then math has almost twice as much intervention time as the reading does. So, I mean, I think these are all things that we thought about in administration when we thought about how to staff the position or what to do with, the, with these kinds of staffing. This is an old uh, chestnut that may not apply anymore, but U32 has always sort of been thought of as pretty strong on the, uh, on the arts and science, uh, on, the, on language, English, mm -hmm. and weaker in the math and sciences. Mm -hmm. And is that still, does, does, do, the, do the, the performance test evidence a weakness in that? Tend to point that same direction, yes. So would that be a reason maybe for uh, supporting a little higher FTC and uh, FTE rather than in that? Well, we do. Yeah, right. I mean, that, that, we, yeah. I mean yeah. that's part of the, I mean, the number of interventions that we provide in math are higher than the number of interventions we provide in our reading and writing programs already. Okay. The, it, an additional position on top of that would just add more to it, you know, in terms of the, the support. Oh, the, the measurements you were doing were without the math? Without having a per, no, without having the position of math white table as a separate position. The 10.6 10 FTE is Isn't without white table? Correct. Okay. It's with the teacher staffing. It. Got it. How long has this model been in place in English? This is the second year of that model. <coughs> And we don't have that kind of tier two support in, in uh, science. <coughs> Generally, kids will seek out their science teachers during callback or before or after school is the way that they get support there. Questions? Yeah. Um, this is really a fascinating case because, I mean, you've just made a very strong structural argument, I think. And if I didn't know anything other than what you have said, um, I would say, huh, open and shut. Um, however, there's, there's a, a pragmatic dimension to this that seems to be um, very important. And the, I mean, I have, I don't know, did you have a chance to see Ginger's, Ginger Knight's um, Why Gym at Math White Table Matters to Us? Did you see this? I haven't seen that one specifically, no. Yeah. I've seen, I've got- You've seen others? I have uh, petitions on my desk. I have uh, emails from parents and students. I have, I have a lot. So, Scott, I would just say this is, for me, making this decision has to be on the business side mm -hmm. because there are other people who are we're reducing in force that have no one who has ever come here and spoken for them and and so i mean if it's a popularity contest for who we keep in the school i said you know <laughs> he wins <laughs> I, I don't know i don't know how to answer that question but Sorry, Charlie. No, I, 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 was bad form. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I don't think it's a popularity contest. I, I value the input that the uh, community has brought here. And I don't think mm -hmm. sure they like Jim, but I don't think it's because they like Jim that they're saying that this is such a uh, valuable issue. So I would not characterize it as just a popularity contest. Although that's always a concern. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, when, I, when I sort of try to understand, try to um, know, get a sense of what people were saying, what this testimony actually meant. Um, that was one of my questions. Is it just because he's beloved, so like, you know, Mr. Chips or something? And, um, 
or is something happening that's important to learning? And when I, um, it, it seems, the evidence to me, the, um, the personal testimony, uh, not just from you know parents and, um, and former students, alumni, um, but present students, students not only who use the white table, but students who are classmates and friends of students who use the white table, um, are, are the, the unanimity of opinion is really quite striking. And I think it's, um, it's Im impossible to, for, for me anyway, to ignore um, the, the, the business argument, the structural argument, uh, is, is compelling, you know, as far as it goes. But I just have to, you know, come back to what we're here for. And um, if kids are learning math, if there are kids who are learning math who would not otherwise be learning math as well, or as, <coughs> as successfully, um, then I think you know, the presence of this resources on a pragmatic basis is justified. And I would, you know, even if it's structurally problematic or ungainly or you know, the work chart is not pretty or, or whatever it might be, um, if something works, my inclination is, let's do that and try to figure out some way to sustain it and build around it and because, as we all know, you know, it could be, I think you were saying, Karen, last time, who knows, you know, Jim is a retired teacher. He might, he might get sick, he might decide that Vermont winters are too much for him. Um, but I think my own sense is that when you've got something good going, you try to try to you know um, get as much value as as we can from it. So one of the issues I have is you know most of this emotional outpouring is thank goodness for this this worked for me you know and I know there's certain ways I learned or something worked for me that doesn't work for you or for you. And we don't know that the 10.6 math teachers doing the same thing, being present at the white table, where I can come say, hey, help me out with this. I, I'm not getting this Algebra 2 problem. Can you help me through this? Having that same space with those people, we don't know that that won't be just as helpful. Because it hasn't been tried. Right? We do not know that that won't be just as good and just as helpful, if not more so. More personalities. Well, well yeah, and, and you know, so Joe Bob teacher didn't help me, but Chrissy teacher, I understand how she explained it. There's different, I, I don't know. I'm just saying we, we're acting like the solution that has been given to us from administration is doomed to fail, it's not gonna work. It's not that the white table's shoved in the closet and not happening. They didn't get rid of it. They're keeping the fundamentals, have come up with a solution. And when I understand going down to each of them would only be teaching four, yeah, we're cutting a highly trained math teacher. We have to cut a, we have to cut a teacher then to, to have someone at this table. Uh, right? No, um, I think. Unless we say we're not cutting. No. Um, well. Which isn't perhaps, fiscally responsible for well, what we charge them to do. I think. The, the, kind of, the kind of thing, when I talk about being pragmatic and sort of recognizing when there's a, there's a resource of unusual value that one is lucky enough to have um, and trying to you know, realize as much of that value as possible, um, rather than, you know, if we think about the strategic approach that you're talking about, Kari, um, I could see, I mean, I, I, I 
apologize because you just okay. trampling all over your turf. But my, um, Scott, anyway. you can just say it. I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, but I, I could. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I could envision, for example, um, having because Jim is a veteran teacher himself. He's he's um, a para right now because he's retired right. and basically is doing this for fun. And uh, I guess a little bit of profit. But um, he potentially, as a, as a member of the math faculty, you know, as, a, as a, both a senior and a junior member, he's potentially a resource to help some of the teachers maybe teach better. Because from what I understand from, <coughs> from um, Lucy, Mia, and your compadres, is that um, Jim is, really knows how to get, how to explain things, and how to get it across. He could be a, like a coach even. Um, he, could, he could work his own transition out of U32 by helping train up the, um, the, perhaps, the other math teachers, helping to expand their repertoire of, of math teaching skills. I don't know, that's just totally, um, it's the kind of thing that one could do with a resource, just in theory. I see the battle lines are being drawn, friendly, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, I agree, I hear you loud and clearly, but we don't know if it will succeed. What we do know is it's succeeding now, and there's a risk that it won't work as well. And my supposition is that it won't work as well because of the response that we've gotten from, from students in regard to uh, their relations with the other teachers. One of the things I really like about having Jim here, a guy that I don't know at all, is, um, is the fact that it breaks the homogeneity, homogeneity a little bit of the school, to have somebody a little different, not quite a teacher, somebody different. And I think that helps, <coughs> helps the, the culture of the school to have more of that rather than more of every, people all graduated with the same degree, degrees, all sort of, uh, yeah, I'd like to have, I'd like to see a greater diversity and I think this provides it, especially when you consider the range of, uh, of uh, responses that students have to various teaching types. You're right, one teacher, Jim works well, Bob works well for one person, or. Christy works well for another. Um, that, I would argue, would suggest, supports the notion that we ought to keep Steve, uh, Jim as yet another one, another person who may reach students who are not otherwise reached. Within George's argument, then we need a white table for science, and we need one for, we need one for almost every category. I, can I just point out one other thing, is that now we're going back to the person instead of the position. I agree. And I think we just need to. But, but I'm willing to do that. Yeah. I, no, I strongly I, believe that. I, I, am, I do not put business ahead of, of education. And yeah. that's one of the reasons that upsets me. And it's one of the reasons that I understand the legislature chose to uh, uh, denominate superintendents as chief executive officers. We're not a corporation. We're a school. Yeah. We don't train people. We educate people. And that means critical thinking, and that means kind of inner, but it sounds like what happens at the, at the math team at that table. So, anyway. Okay. Um, I'm going to Yeah, I was going to say that not every subject is the same, and what you're saying is one for one for one, right? Like uh, science and English have to have one math, white table person. And that's just not true. Math is a whole different beast. I know kids who've broken down from math, you know. And I think that's not the same as all the other subjects. You don't need a person for white table for you know biology because they can you know work it out with themselves or with their teachers easily. You know, easily. But with Jim, he has a whole other perspective to math, a whole other attitude towards math. And I I don't think he's here for the money. To be honest, his kids each make very good money. He's talked about it a lot of times in class. I think he'd be doing whatever he wants. He enjoys this thoroughly. He loves working with the kids. And that's something you can't bring in from this just highly trained math teacher, right? Like you can either be highly trained in math or highly trained in teaching, and every student would rather have a highly trained teacher than a highly trained mathematician.
I get it. I totally get it. There are teachers, there are teachers who got it and teachers who don't. I yeah. totally get it. But I, you know, I, I still. I just want to say again, from my perspective, I'm really uncomfortable um, because I don't see it as our role. I, 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 I think that I'm nowhere. I'm, I, I'm nowhere near an expert in education. I actually know. Being on this board for six years, it's surprising to me how little I know about education. But I do know that we've hired some excellent, highly trained, very experienced people to make these decisions for us. And if we can't articulate why it's a bad decision before the decision is made, then we shouldn't really be worried about it. I, I, I feel like we're overstepping our bounds saying it was a bad decision after the fact. Oh, I'm, I'm not saying necessarily it was a bad decision. Just that in light of information that has come in. Uh, and I think it is our role um, definitely not to second guess or um, micromanage or in any way um, constrain the people, the excellent people that we've hired. In fact, my aim is to enable as much as possible, enable the, the, the highest performance possible and to be just sounding board and to, to relay concerns that we pick up and try to form together a, a greater mind um, in order to, you know, to make good decisions. So can I sort of call the question since yeah, we don't have a motion the, on the, the table? Right. Before we do that, I just want to make sure that Carl or Jonathan, do you have anything you want to add at this point? Well, everybody, I think, is making valid points, I'll say that. Uh, um, some I agree more with than others, but um, uh, but but I think I'm, I wasn't at the last meeting, but the meeting prior, I, I believe I, I said something to the effect when when so many of the teachers were here and students were here as well. Yeah. To me, that was very impactful to hear directly from them. So that's that. The other thing is math is unlike many of the other academic subjects in the school in the sense that. Um, for, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly how long I've been on the board, but quite a long time. And we've struggled, the school has struggled, and nationally we struggle with math in a way that's different than every other academic subject. So in my mind, if there's an additional support, and I know we have additional teachers, and the school I think is doing everything, we're doing everything we can to support math, I, you know, I, I, my personal view is that having additional supports, even beyond, above and beyond what we already have in place, is probably a good idea with respect to math, because the numbers come back every year. And, and so that, to me, means that we, we, should, we should err on the side of, let's try to do whatever we can uh, conceivably um, to to uh, help the kids achieve in math. So, yeah. just one other thing too, I don't see the equivalence between a full-time FT math teacher and a very part-time white table person from a budgetary perspective. They're not the same thing. This Jim is not receiving benefits. Yes, he is. Oh, he is, okay. Jim is so, a full-time employee he is. with okay. benefits. Yes. All right, okay, so I'm sorry about that. I'm That's okay. About that. um, Okay, so you know maybe maybe there needs to be some some looking at you know what that cost is, but yeah. uh, but the other the other the other I mean in, in keeping with kind of my argument already, I would say if we need an extra teacher, we should have an extra teacher in math, and if it's the white table position, then it should be the white table position. I mean that's that's kind of where I come down on that. So. I'm not sure I have anything new to add. I, I, there's a piece of me that's intrigued by the argument of when we're going to right size versus whether we're going to right size. I mean, there, there's an argument. Hey, bargain great teacher. Who's, who's, who wants to shake a stick at that, you know? But if that bargain great teacher is short term, and is going to be in the place of a longer term permanent full time teacher. Um, I don't think that's an appropriate choice to make. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't say, oh, let's 
let's trim the math department by a, by a full by a, by a full FTE so that we can keep a beloved and successful white table position. Um, there's a piece of me that, you know, it's working. I don't want to take away something that's working. You know, if it's working, don't fix it. But, like Karen says, we don't know that it won't work the other way. Um, and there's, the, actually, I'm going to go all the way back to Scott's question of the other week is, when would we as a board change our mind about something that we had come to? I got no qualms changing our mind when we've got the new information to act on. I don't have any qualms about that at all. I'm, I'm not sure I really feel like we have new information to act on. We may have gotten more information since we made the original decision, but I'm not sure it's really new information. I don't think we you know, nobody said to us, you know, Jim's, Jim's not the best math teacher. You know, we, we didn't know we were we were letting go of somebody really good when we made that decision originally. Um, and I think the argument, the, the sort of fairness argument of other staff that have been like, oh, I don't know how. Well, I think we would need a really solid justification for doubling back on one person, one person being left versus the other seven that were on that same list. Uh, I think it'd be pretty hard. You know, I think we'd be. I think we'd need a really solid explanation of why. Um, and I'm not sure that we could muster that, but I'm not sure it makes sense with our longer term goal of right sizing the school. And yes, it's a crummy position to be in to have to make these kind of calls. You know, the, the, the soft part of me wants to say, hey, great teacher, hold on to him, you know, just cling to him for another three, four years until he's ready to move to Florida or whatever, you know. But, but if that doesn't work, with our, with our, if that doesn't work with the staffing of our math program longer term, I don't, don't see how we can make that a choice. Okay, back to you, Karen. Did you, did you oh, have just, that? I mean, I guess we're having lovely discussions, but. You said call the question. Call the no question, question really. Is, is, that, <laughs> is someone going to make a motion? Are we going to do anything? Or. But We're going to do something. There, there's one more great idea. It's, it's, I move that we keep Jim. We'll get on tape. Did you? I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay. I'll, go, I'll, I'll second. Just, I think we all have thought about it long and hard, and every position I've heard so far has got integrity, so let's do what we think is right. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Discussion? How would I word that, though? I don't know. You want to oh. <laughs> shine on that? Can we uh, retain the current staffing? Uh, Current staff for the white table. Thanks. Math white right. table. Right. What? Math white right table? Math white right table. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I assume implied in that is that we would have to figure out the expense some other way. Squeeze in the balloon, yeah. Yeah. And, and for our knowledge, it's what are we talking about? $40,000? Approximately. Maybe a little, a, little, a, little, a little less. It would be non personnel since we're past the roof. We're past mm -hmm. the rift stage. Uh, yes. Uh, unless unless there was a personality left and uh, interesting. Okay. May I other discussion? Okay. Yes. Um, is it possible to put it from the um, I'm blanking on the name, the reserve not the reserve fund, but the fund balance? The fund balance, balance. thank you. The board would have to approve that. I, w I wouldn't recommend that. I mean, I would recommend that you direct me to, uh, to find it within the existing budget. Really? Mm -hmm. Would you have a, you have something in mind? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's... I mean, that decision doesn't need to be made tonight. Yes, yes, right. right. And, and I, it's not so much my business. Um, you know, unless Pres it's really be be <laughs> <laughs> no more you're going to spend the motion on the table. <laughs> yeah. More discussion? Everyone clear on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 That was three. All those opposed say nay. Aye. Nay. Nay. Three. Um, so the chair will break a tie by voting that. <laughs> what do you? <laughs> <laughs>
and um, yeah, we're, we're excited to, to rot in position to be in. Yeah, right. That's, that's where we're paid to pay for Okay, um, let's move on to 3.4 proficiency based graduation requirements. Oh, so let me just introduce this. We had to ask for this. Obviously, a topic of uh, great importance and some confusion, some concern, and um, so we wanted to get a little bit of a you know, refresher on on what, what what it's all about and what's the current state of things and where we're headed. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everybody had the booklet. Um, so I think at some point in time we have handed these to mm -hmm. everyone, but um, this is really a, a great way for if you spend a few moments with it for you to be able to talk to others about it. Um, I think there's some, some pretty straightforward things that would have, maybe help you as a board um, when people ask you questions about it. Um, kind of one of the biggest one of the biggest pieces of proficiency based system is that we are no longer depending on time in a seat to determine whether or not somebody is ready to graduate. Um, it's now moved and, and I heard it explained much better um, is that students have to demonstrate as opposed um, you know as opposed to the past where they just participate. <laughs> you know, and so um, so they just have to demonstrate an understanding. I, I mean, <laughs> let's make it clear: we, we're changing 120 years of of thought in how students demonstrate their knowledge. Um, and uh, and it was in the past you sat in a class for uh, what's considered a Carnegie unit of time, which is 120 hours. That gives you a full credit of as long as you've got at least a D in the class um, in the way that our system is defined differently in other schools you know it can be a C in other schools or, or or something different but it was always 120 hours now what we are really trying to do is create a system where our kids learn our student learning outcomes are the guide and the standards that are associated with that which that's part of the booklet to show you which um, the student learning outcomes that we have um, but, but you know, we're trying to make sure that kids can show us that they know something before they leave, so that they're ready for both college and career. And, um, and I think that that's the kind of the heart of what a proficiency system is. Our theory of action that we have used in our implementation plan for all of the work that we're doing as a supervisory union said that we needed three things: we needed clear learning outcomes, we needed high quality instruction, and we needed a balanced assessment system. All of those three things are part of what we do for a proficiency-based education system. Now, I think that... Do you mind seeing those one more time? Okay, so there's... Um, we start by we clear learning outcomes, high-quality instruction, That's all right. that this way. And, a, um, and a balanced assessment system. And so the work that we've done over the past three years as a staff has been to try to to do those three things to create a system that's built on proficiency. It's messy. I mean, like, there's just no two ways about it. Our kids aren't always, it's not always clear what the learning targets are. The assessments were being, you know, are being built along the way. And, and there's always the argument is all of these things should have been taken care of before, but there's no way to move to a new system while you're educating kids in which you don't do some of the work while you're doing the work. Um, and so I think we're in a, I mean, I think it's, I defer to the kids on, on some of this, is that, is that what was really confusing three years ago is less confusing now, because our teachers have been doing it for multiple years now. The kids are starting to see it in different ways. Uh, the seniors are just happy that they're in the system, they're still credit system as they go out. Um, uh, but, but we're starting to see, I, I think a good example is I sat with a parent uh, and kid the other day, and we looked through um, where they were. And this student had already shown that they had reached advanced levels of performance in their um, math classes, um, some of their science, or their math standards, some of their science standards, they've met their, um, you know, they've met several in um, like PE and health, so they were completing those. 
And, um, and so now, you know, what's left is this kid moves into their senior year. They need their artistic expression, and uh, they need to uh, do some, a little more work in their science. Um, and they figure, given how they're doing right now, that they're going to meet their literacy standards in their um, 11th grade year. So what we're really saying, and then, and then the question that the parents ask me, which I think is a really great question, is that is he ready both for early college next year? And we can look at it and we can say, yeah, you know, he's, he's proficient at, at worst in most of his stuff and most of his graduation standards. And so that, to us, means that he's ready for college. Now, he won't have quite everything, but that's, that's okay. In early college, you can go take a couple of courses that help you meet. I mean, if you pass a college course, you've shown us that you're proficient in college level work, which means you can graduate. I mean, that's kind of the gist of it. And so, I, I mean, there's a thousand little details that our teachers and our students are working through on all of this. But I, th I think the message that, that we're starting to see now is that our kids are starting to understand that they have to do something to be able to graduate. And we had a lot of kids in multiple different areas who may have just gotten by with a D in something. And, um, and so that D is no longer really a valid grade anymore. And we want to make sure that you're prepared when you leave U32 so that you don't have to take remedial courses, that you can begin a certificate program, um, that you can enter the workforce with you know, a decent amount of skills so that you're ready and, and able to do those things. And that's what a proficiency system really is built on. Um, we're, we, we've gone in head first in it, but I, I mean, I defer to, to you guys. I mean, we have a, a celebrity when it comes to, uh, to proficiency, um, if, you, if you listen to the podcast, but I haven't yet. So. <laughs> Kari's the one who told me. But I don't know, is there, what would you guys add to? Um, well, I'm in the grade that is graduating first. So. Guinea pig grade. Yes, oh, well, funny you say that, student, because I remember a ninth grade presentation you made to us where you said, you will not be the guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I think you missed something. <laughs> No, but, um, well, I was actually just looking at my graduation standard proficiencies in IC, which were made available to us this year. And I would say that it is more clear now than it was three or four years ago, but it still seems very, it still seems fuzzy, I guess, and not completely clear. And especially, like, because it, I think what makes it most confusing is that it differentiates between class to class, so some teachers do it differently other teachers and some teachers are moving completely away from the old grading system and some and completely transforming to proficiencies and making their class fit proficiencies but some teachers are using the old grading system and their old classes and trying to make proficiencies fit to the old system and those are the classes where it's not working out as well but it also there are different ways to go so for science and math it's harder in some places and easier than others but then in English and it just, the whole thing seems a little, and it also, a lot of kids say that like, oh, we're not going to get into college, which is obviously not a valid worry, but it does seem, because it, for us, it's hard to understand our like, final grades, so I think in that sense, that's why kids are worried about how others are going to see it, because if you yourself can't understand how you're being assessed, and you're scores, then it's hard to understand how somebody else is going to understand it. So in regard to the, the, the um, elements of, of the program that Stephen talked to, um, which are clear learning outcomes, high quality instruction, balanced assessment, do you feel like those are being achieved? <coughs> Um, again? Sure, what is clear learning outcomes, high quality instruction, balanced assessment. Those are kind of hard things to get. Okay. Clear um, learning outcomes, maybe. Huh? Yeah, I would say that um, I've seen all the standards, I'm looking at all the standards right now, so it's, they, I know what all of the outcomes are. It's, I think what's confusing is how you achieve them sometimes, and then how you're being assessed on achieving them. 
Because okay. it, it, sometimes it falls to the teachers. The, what the teacher gets to decide in some places, and sometimes not as straightforward. So in math, it might be more straightforward because it like, can be clearly seen whether you were able to answer the question or not. But in English, it might be more inferential as whether how you were analyzing the book and in what way. So do you think that the, 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 those two areas, the um, uh, clear learning outcomes and balanced assessment, do you feel like those are areas that are improving as we get more and more familiar with? Yeah, I'm successful? not sure what balanced assessment entails, but... Well, you talked across disciplines, which I thought was kind of interesting. I don't yeah. know if that's... I'm sorry. Uh, no. okay. The questions are good. Yeah, I'm happy to ask questions. Um, yeah, I think that would, that's because it, it seems like you have to fit proficiencies and so I perform differently in each of the subjects because in some places it's easier to get the four in part because it's what I'm better at but also because the teacher grades it differently than as to in science where it might be harder or in math because those are subjects where I struggle but it's also not as clear it seems or harder to I think there's, stuff. there's definitely more discrepancies because I get graded with proficiency in some of my classes in things like English and foreign language because they're a little bit less cut and dry than like math yeah. and science. So math and science, it's more like, did they answer the questions? Did they like maybe do the extension to get the four? But like in English, like reading a paper is so like subjective to the teacher, so it's much harder for teachers to be consistent, not really like through any fault of their own, there just needs to be more consistent requirements for those classes. And I, I mean, I would argue too that those are age old problems. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's not, that's not that, yeah. yeah, that's not really the new problem. I think that, that one of the things that we've tried to, the clearer learning target piece is that what does it mean? Like, and, and, and part of it too is that we don't have a tremendous amount of what we call exemplars. You know, what does a four level paper look like? Because we don't have or we haven't had in the past a whole lot of those kinds of discussions around. We can get you some of Scott's papers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so vocabulary use would be high. <laughs> Sorry, I had to take my one moment. Um, but I, I mean, I think that that's that's the the thing is that um, they're they're correct on that. And the, the confusion is some of the same areas that were confusing before, but we didn't really acknowledge that they were confusing in the old system. Your D sometimes came from turning in homework, uh, from participating in class and being nice while you were there, and those kinds of things were, they're important, but not necessarily important to, sh to show that you understand the content of the class. Um, and, and so those, yeah, so, Another piece of this is separating out the work habits, the, what we call the transferable skills, um, from the content knowledge. And, and I would argue that, that is our choice of pulling those two things apart and holding them equal in terms of their importance is one of the defining characteristics of the way that U32 has approached proficiency. Because other schools have approached it to where we keep the old grading system around content knowledge and will evaluate your transferable skills separately. You get your old grading through the content. You do the right thing around transferable skills in terms of demonstrating that. And, and then you graduate. That's one of the ways. So when you talk about the differences in how schools approach that, which means that are you, what's the standard of performance that you're asking for in the content area? Isn't necessarily changed um, in when you keep the old system of grading, right? It, there's still a fair amount of um, the content knowledge being um, in the A, B, C, D, F system that most schools we used E here, but, but in that system, if you, if you still grade that way in the content knowledge, you don't get to those three questions of are you making it clear, are, are you working on your instruction, and are you assessing the students in multiple ways. That's what a balanced system means. That it's not just one way of assessing you, but you can demonstrate it multiple different ways as to how you 
can learn something. And that's the idea that a paper for one kid may be a video for another, right? If the content can be demonstrated through both of those things equally well, then we shouldn't look at that the assessment of those things any differently. You know, it's the content. Do, did you demonstrate that you knew the content through whichever medium that you used? Um, some of the old system is do the paper or do a video or do, and and the the variety wasn't necessarily there because the grade was about the product and completing it, not about the content that was within that product. I think that got a little confusing, but no. So I have a question. Go um, ahead. So this was this was a, yet another uh, mandate from state government, right? That we moved to this system. Proficiency, yes. And uh, my understanding is Maine also adopted the system and then pulled back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are there other states? Is there is this part of a larger so, movement? So many the Northeast has been particularly uh, robust in this in changing some of the rules around graduation. So I know in Connecticut, where I came from before, they changed the state law so that students didn't just have to do seat time, they also had the option of demonstrating, let's see, they called theirs competency. Yes, based. New Hampshire's in a mastery, I can go from New Hampshire. New Hampshire? Yeah, as well, yeah. So similar yeah. principles in play? Yeah, it, 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 for New Hampshire, um, it came through, it didn't even come through legislation, it came through state board regulation, through the state department regulation, mm -hmm. and competency based, and that all high schools, I think they were last year, all high schools had to graduate based on a competency-based system. It's either last year or this current okay. year. Senior I class. think it's the same with, uh, yeah. And Rhode, Island, and Rhode Island's a year away, a mm -hmm. year behind ours, and they call theirs uh, competency. Uh, their their mastery, mastery, mastery based. So there's there's they all mean the four same different thing. terms that are used for this: standards-based, competency-based, mastery-based, and proficiency-based. Just depends on which state you're working. And, and, and this is the normal education lease that happens. Right. Yeah, it's, 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 Each one sells a different book. There is a movement, um, at, least, at least in the Northeast. I just one more question. I get to you, Jennifer. But how will we know, or can we know, down the road and looking back, if a, a student graduating from U32 under proficiency base actually knows more or has more skills than under the old system? So for that, we need ex we need we would probably need an external measure of some kind. So things like I mean, there are the national standardized tests. So the SAT, the ACT, the SBAC, those are ways that and we they measure proficiency. So the SAT is trying to move that way. The ACT is probably a little bit better yeah. because it's subject area. I'm going to argue but, that they can't. Assessment has been a, a year in my master's yeah. work and. Um, it, we're going to get into what we call depths of knowledge and how deep mm -hmm. the, the, the highest way, and this is the issue what Charlie's talking about, applying your knowledge and being able to communicate it and critical thinking and problem solving, which are all our transferable skills, that can be measured in authentic classroom assessments. It's really hard to measure those on a standardized test. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have any thoughts about my question? Uh, I, you will not be able to do comparables across because we didn't have those before. Will be a little measure going forward as we make better assessments, more common assessments, and that's one of the things that I've seen with my time here is that we just started having common assessments across classrooms, right. mm -hmm. not even across grades, just across classrooms. So if you were taking algebra one in one class and one in the other, until what three years ago, Stephen, or it was, it's been just shortly that they've aligned the assessments. So if I sit in this teacher's classroom and this teacher's classroom. We're using this common assessment. Not all of them. The formatives should be what you need to, to know and, and, and how you know what I'm doing in my classroom today doesn't need the same, but there's got to be some common common assessments across to be able to understand. Are the kids in this class and this class able to do the same thing? So and I would say the other standard measure that we might want to use I mean, is the is what what are our kids doing in four years yeah. and in six years, you know, um, and how do we get at that data? You know, there's the National Clearinghouse data around college, um, but what are our students doing? You know, were they able to move through programs beyond here? You know, were they, are there more opportunities for those kids? Or the, you know, for those that go straight into the workforce, 
are they earning better livings, you know, as a result of the work that we do here? Stuff that we didn't really measure well before, but I think are the important measures of, of whether or not our graduates are successful. Now, uh, Kari, I would add that I think, in theory, at least to a little bit, different populations of students are going to benefit from this differently. Mm -hmm. uh, I th it, it, to my mind, proficiency-based serves the student that struggled more under the old system. The D student is going to be served better by the proficiency-based education because we're not going to let them slip through the system. And so that means if we did have mechanisms for measuring how, how did it work 10 years ago, just how does it work 10 years from now, you know, a Lucy might not show any big change. It, you know, it, 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 she's gonna come out of here with the same proficiencies, sort of regardless of how we measure it. It's the students that we might let slip through the system that are gonna see a real benefit, to my, to my mind. I think Jennifer. Yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, I have a couple comments. First of all, you know that you can delay proficiency for another year. There's no requirement that you have to have it for graduating seniors next year. The AOE has made that very clear, so if you wanted to delay it, I'd be all for it. I think that the rollout was really um, rough. You're getting rid of a whole semester of grades for the ninth graders who are graduating next year. Um, so uh, I hope that you're aware of that, the board, that the board is aware of that, that you are not locked into next year as the first year for using it for grading. Secondly, um, the Vermont legislature had a um, professor from UVM come in to talk about proficiencies. She's a teacher of teachers. And she indicated that if you want to have a, a robust proficiency-based grading system, then you have to actually have three things. You need to have personalized learning plans, you need to have flexible pathways, you need to have proficiency-based assessments. And all of them need to be equally robust. At U32, they're not. The PLPs are not at all robust. The kids take them, they write in whatever baloney they have to write in to get out of TA. We know what you really were about. Yeah, I was, but I held, I held that. Um, and, and so I really, it, you, you have talked about proficiencies for the past 15 minutes, and not once did anybody mention PLPs, and not once did anybody mention flexible pathways. I really think that if you want to, if you want to do proficiencies, you got to do it right, and it's not going to work if you don't. And so it's a little. I'm a, I'm kind of surprised that you're talking about proficiencies four years after you've started doing it. I'm wondering why this wasn't brought up. I mean, I, I suspect it was brought up, but you were, we're talking as if it's just starting, um, rather than where are we and how is it going. This sounds like you're still getting up to speed on what proficiencies even are. Um, so and yet, for four years, our kids have been in the midst of it. So I would certainly ask that there be um, more work on this, both both for the students, for the personalized learning plans, if if, if you want to keep them proficiencies, um, and and that you really do a much better job of um, communicating with parents what's going on. You know, for a while, Stephen sent out some emails about proficiencies when they were having, when they were going through a lot of turmoil over it, which was great, um, but then it sort of stopped, and we haven't gotten anything in a really long time, and we don't get regular updates on how things are going. It was, there were a lot of problems with the website. Um, we had teachers who weren't putting anything in. Um, we had stuff on the website that was not accurate. Um, and so I, I, I hope that you as a board really delve into some of this, because this is actually what people care about, what students care about, and it's what, what um, parents care about when it comes to how the kids are doing in school. And for a long time, for at least two years, maybe even three, you didn't even know how your kid was doing in school because the, because the website was so difficult to navigate. Um, I know Stephen's heard all this, heard me say all this before, and he's heard it from a lot of other people too, so this isn't new to him, maybe it's new to you. But it, it has been really problematic, and I'm not opposed to it. I think what Carl said is accurate, that it is, could be a really good system for kids who struggle. And I think that um, you, a lot of the pushback is coming from parents and kids who do well in school um, <coughs> because they succeeded under the old program. And I, and I understand that. 
Um, but what I'm asking, if you are going to do this program, then you really need to make sure you're doing it right. And don't force it on, on families and kids before it's ready. Oh, just, just to be fair, um, some people on the, haven't been on the board very long and, and are learning. So, you know, Charlie's just sort of, he doesn't have a kid in the current school like I do. So I, I'm learning from the... Uh, being thrown, being being thrown, years, is, being sure. thrown off the dock is a lot. June 30th. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's where it, it can seem like there's less knowledge about what's going on than there really is. And, and to be fair, we haven't talked about it in a while. We haven't talked about it in a few meetings. But, yeah. All right. Any other thoughts yeah. before we move on? So, so yeah. I, if I can offer one thing, so so Jennifer is exactly right. So the multiple pathways, the the personalized learning plans, those are other things that that we can bring forward to, to talk to you guys about because they are important pieces. Because there were actually two pieces of, of of work. So a lot of what we just talked about was the educational quality standards, which set the proficiency work, and the other one was Act 77, which said the personalized learning plans, the multiple pathways, were the way to go about all of this. And so there's there's several pieces of legislation and and rulemaking that that prompted a lot of this work and and, and set these dates. Scott, you get the last word. Oh my goodness, what a responsibility. Um, there's one aspect of this that may relate to some of the anxieties that parents feel, which is the, um, the, the basic effect of, of this tends to be grade deflationary. Um, that, you know, as you were saying, um, the, the student who passed with a D is no longer going to be able to pass. And the student who maybe got A's under the old system um, may not get fours under the new system. Fours are really hard to get. So, um, and, and that's a very interesting development because typically it's a kind of elite move. Um, you know, your public high school A's are worth nothing but C's that are hoity-toity prep school kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and, and that's, you know, that's, in some ways, that's good, I mean, um, to, to just contain the, what seemed like the, the forever trend in, in great inflation. But, um, but I think the anxiety may come from, you know, the, now the student's market value as measured by a grade point mm -hmm. average is now um, lower than it might have been under the old system. And yet, I guess the exchange rate, <laughs> um, um, it's, not, it's not commonly realized that, that this is what U32 has done. So even though I know colleges are saying, oh, proficiency, we understand it, it's not going to make a difference, I think that um, there may be some justification for you know, um, maybe trying harder to um, to help those kids who are going out into the uh, higher education market. Um, so maybe a good topic for June to discuss is the materials that we're preparing at, and what we're preparing to do as these kids enter the market for uh, colleges. Because we are, we do have a plan that we, we're bringing together to that. Yeah, which nice. we just have to finalize before we share. Yeah, um, but now I have a deadline. <laughs> You guys aren't meeting a whole lot beyond that. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll come back to that at the end of that. Mm -hmm. Talk about future report. Okay, so I'd like to sort of pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, 3.5 is board retreat. So this is traditionally the time of year that we would be planning for an off-site meeting to consider our work, mainly our work plan for the future year. Given the circumstances, is there any interest in doing anything like that this year? I'm not seeing much. So. It might not exist. Right. Yeah. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 3.6 is the annual financial management questionnaire, which is on page 12. Yep. Can you introduce this? Yes, I will. Um, this started around 2012, 2013 from the state auditors um, agency, and that every year the government Schools had to join this, I 
think municipalities do this, but I know that schools had to join some other government entities for the state auditors to go through a checklist that's reviewed by our external auditor and affirms that way we, that way, way Lori fills this out every year as to what we do and how we best practices in our financial management. We have to present it to boards every year, and the chair signs off that we presented it to you for any questions. I'll tell you, as in other years, you ask me what's changed, I'll just go to the right to the answer, which is nothing has changed from the previous years you've seen this. Uh, Lori and her finance team get high marks on uh, the government system. Right. Similar questions to what the auditor would be asking. Right, and it's procedures. just one that check out. It's a self self assessment that we do, and then they just spot check it. Oh. Um, just one question, though. Mm -hmm. How how deep is the bench in Lori's shop? I mean, if it could um, be, so we are finishing a. Uh, we had a consultant come in that the executive committee approved for looking at our personnel um, structure and central office and finances for financial and human resources. And we're short the staff we should have, of course, for the size, for the number of organizations and size of money that flows through us. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll just acknowledge that we reviewed it. All right, thank you. So 3.7 is board observation opportunities. This is the time of year where there's a lot to observe. Yeah, I'll send these out to the board members as well, just so that you have a copy. But just as a quick note, on May 9th through the 11th, we actually have the Allstate Music Festival here at the school. And it's not just our students, but it is certainly a showcase of talent from Vermont. Um, I highly encourage it. My own child participated in it her three years that she was here. Um, so I attended, I think it's a great event, May 9th through the 11th. Um, are, there's a lot of things on the calendar from jazz band to choral to orchestra. It's fantastic. Um, uh, we have June 3rd is the high school concert. June 7th is Dance 32 and the Spring Art Show on June 7th. Oh, I missed a May date. May 17th, we're going to have a cultural diversity day. I don't know, are you going to speak to that a little bit in the uh, student yes. report? Okay, I'm not going to sue you thunder. And then uh, Mentor Night, I'm pretty sure is June 17th. I see it on May 15th. Mentor Night is May 15th. Mentor Appreciation. Ooh, I'm May way 15th. off on that one. <laughs> <laughs> May, say it again. 15th. 15th. We also have Decision Day coming up. Oh, yeah. um, but I saw it twice on the calendar, so I'm not sure which one is right. So I reached out to Lisa, and, and we'll have that on whatever Stephen sends out to you. Yeah. Um, it's either the 24th or the 30th. What, what is that exactly? Oh, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's an assembly where um, all of the seniors get to announce what they're doing next year. Oh, and then you have to hit a gong. And the gong. You don't have to. Wow. That one makes you hit the gong. <laughs> so gong. we usually have somebody from faculty say a few words about the decisions that they made, and then the kids tell us what they're doing next year. They get to celebrate. Yeah. yeah. In, in my youth, the gong show yes. <laughs> was, was quite a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> the show was made. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling not to make an age joke. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll send out those dates so that you, which you know where they are. The board is certainly invited to any of those uh, events. Um, and there will be branching out and pilot presentations in the last few weeks of school as well. Oh, those are great. Yes. Yeah, those are great. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. So reports to the board, 4.1 is Central Vermont Career Center. So I would, I would just offer that there's a meeting coming up, but they just had a planning meeting. Um, yes, it, it wasn't us. Yeah. Um, so they're, um, they had it yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's why I don't know too much detail. Should have been you should not have been at that one. They are discussing the possibility of moving to a full day program. And so that was a beginning of some of that discussion, but there will be more talk at the, uh, the big board. Which is happening Monday night. Yeah. Monday afternoon at 4 30, I believe. No, so, I'll just for clarity, is there anything for me to do on, on Southern Vermont, really? No? Okay. I thought that was the answer. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Could you say? Along with the policy. <laughs> okay. Good. How about students? Um. So, um, on Monday, one of the seniors um, named Max Sabo did a climate change presentation 
um, it's like this project he's working on through branching out, I think, mm -hmm. um, all year or a semester about um, climate change and um, the implications of it. So that was pretty widely attended, and then on that train of thought, also, yes. also on climate. Um, today there was a climate rally, youth climate rally today at the state house. And so it was a field trip, or you could go on your own too. And there was a decent number of U32 students attending that. Um, and then also, as I'm sure all of you know, um, spring, store, spring sports excuse me, are um, well underway now that the fields are mostly dried out. Things are rolling a little bit more than they were a while ago. Yeah. Um, last night at the school, there was a film presentation of Downstream, which is a film about the trauma and implications of children who have parents in, who are incarcerated. Um, and then also a lot of testing is happening right now. Um, this week the tests are for, you should talk about it, I have no uh, idea what it is. The juniors on Monday and tomorrow for an hour and a half in the morning have to take a standardized science test. The state science test. State science test, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And then yeah, next week um, the AP tests begin for two weeks, so a lot of kids are going to be sitting through those. Same here, actually. Do you want to play Oh yeah. Um, and then I think it was a, it was last week that yeah, I was on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. So last week, um, Mia was in Guatemala, but I so I met with um, Bill and Stephen about ways to increase um, student voice in our community, which is sort of a never-ending issue, um, but we came up with some um, potential ideas about um, sort of students fielding opinions and solutions to like policy um, proposals in our school. Like there are several things in the works right now that directly affect students, so the three of us talked about like how we can get their input in a structured and effective way, um, because we don't really have a system in place right now that is serving that role. Yeah, and then Stephen mentioned all states. We want to say more about that. And on May seventeenth, Ginger and I have been planning, or Ginger Knight and I have been planning a diversity day, which is going to be an all day ish event um, surrounding cultural. So we wanted our goal is to bring cultures to the school and education and awareness around cultures, especially ones that usually are misrepresented or we don't often hear a lot about. Um, and so in the morning, we've changed the schedule around. So there's gonna be a band in the morning where we have different people coming into workshops and there are gonna be different movies playing and discussions going around. And then there's gonna be another band in the afternoon that will have the same sort of events. It'll be different activities, but the same kind of things. And then in the afternoon, or at night from 5.30 to 7.30, we're gonna have food and music, I'm pretty sure, out um, outside. It's going to be for the entire community, not just the school. What day was that? May 17th. I'm sure if you guys wanted to come to the workshops and stuff in the morning during the day, that would be great too. 9.30 and 120. Yes. And that will be in the email that you're sending out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I just had one question on the, the movie about the incarcerated parents. Was that shown during the school day or was that after No, that was um, after, school? after school. It was yeah. available to anybody. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was more of a community event. Yeah, yeah right. school, event. Just a school event. Yeah. My mom once. So I heard a little bit about it. So. Do, do you know if Max Sabo's presentation was recorded? It, it was. was. Yes. By our students who are editing it together to okay. um, to do, and, and I, I think we, we sold this. I mean, Lucy sold it well, but um, we had two. Per, he he gave the presentation twice. The first presentation was to the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth graders. The attendance was about half of the auditorium was about what we had. The second uh, presentation was to seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, packed auditorium. And so, it's like this is. No small feat for a senior to stand up in front of almost every one of his peers and give a phenomenal uh, presentation 
I mean, it was great. It's wonderful. And it was a teacher. Yeah, it right. was a teacher. It was <laughs> wonderful. And um, faculty, you know, who are all sometimes skeptical of what's going to happen, right? Because you never know. Um, walked out of there saying, "Wow, that was really, really well done." I mean, he just he demonstrated everything that we ask of a kid. You know, when we want them to show that they know, you know, how to present information to others. And so he did a great job. Okay. Um, I, I've got to um, also watch some kids, seventh graders, present their food truck um, project oh, yeah. Yeah. yesterday. So they had this project that they did, and it was under the guise of being Shark Tank. So two, their they basically all presented to their core, and then two of those presentations were moved forward, and a, a few faculty and myself got to be sharks, which was fun. <laughs> um, just, it was fun to have the lamp of fake dollars. And um, they presented, so the two groups of five students presented their food truck and they, they talked about what they would serve. They had a menu, they had a budget, they had exactly how much money they would need from the sharks. And um, the amazing thing was we peppered them with questions. We had 10 minutes to question them and there was no pause. We did not take it easy on them, and they were just thinking on their feet, and it was wonderful to see the, the thoughtful responses they had, and they, they were quick, and, and they brought in the economics terms that they'd been using. It was really awesome just to see that happening with seventh graders, and I know the night before, the eighth grade um, also from Porthos had done a civil rights museum um, for their parents as an authentic audience. So it was a couple of other um, examples just this week. So. Yeah, and I would say that the student learning outcome that that uh, Shark Tank was was the economics part of mm -hmm. global citizenship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we haven't hit that yet. Yeah, a, we're getting missing, better. Missing gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Economics is an area that we identified as not teaching a lot of as um, as we started looking at our learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting it earlier. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why don't we move on to 4.3 administration. I have talked enough. <laughs> I think I think you did most of the beer part. I don't know if Jody had you great you added about Shark Tank. Anything else you want to add? I, I want Lucy uh, touched on it. I've had probably three or four student groups this year that have talked to me wanting to talk about policy issues and how they move those forward to the board. And that really spurred a piece. Um, I've worked with Up for Learning in Vermont and previously when I was curriculum director, quite a bit with Helen Beatty and. Uh, doing work with getting student voice, mm -hmm. and I know Stephen's going to be talking with her shortly. They've, they've worked here within uh, with our YATS, with the YATS program we've had before, um, but I think it's really important to have student voice in on those, and I think we all agree on that from what Tenor, I've always heard of this board. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to know, and I asked, and Lucy and I, and Stephen were having this discussion, is, you know, it's kind of random, right? And I don't know what the priorities are of the student body. And I think, Lucy, you said something really nice. Is like, I don't know how many students would want to get into that conversation. But I said, I'd like to make it available in a way we have that and talk about what are some of the pressing, pressing things for the students and, and, try to, and try to get that to the board. We tried to like generate ideas about how that would happen because right now um, we don't have like a group that's like solely focused on student voice. Like you think, oh, it might be student council, but they do more like um, community stuff, like community service events and stuff. So we talked about um, some sort of like committee that could be formed by peers, but then we ran into the issue of okay, like everyone who is on that committee is going to be like a super high-flying motivated student who might have a differing opinion and perspective from people not on it. So then we sort of explored options regarding that and we talked about potentially having, like it sounds boring for a teenager to so have given a better name, but like a forum on like an issue where people could come and share um, what they thought about it because that is a way that like theoretically um, the like minority or just less involved opinion could get heard on issues. Diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's a big piece. I know I you've seen in my reports I include stuff in the transition. Right. The, the is, there, on that. is there any update on borrowing? And uh, we think we have a solution that we'll be talking about tomorrow night. We have a short term solution and then there'll be loss of revenue because of that. That's programmed in the budgets already. Uh, but we'll be able to solve it. That's the good news. Okay. 
And that's why I, as Scott, you and Carl saw, I, and I should send that, I, I should continue the practice from last week and send out that packet to everybody so you've all seen it. But there was a memo in there showing you what the borrowing amount is, and I would think there's a solution the bank can heard from their attorney. Yeah. Any other comments on transactions? Yeah. Yeah. for an interim uh, superintendent, and we will meet tomorrow to um, hear a report on what our search has yielded so far. We did hire a, a, a consultant in Mark Andrews to have a couple of good choices, and hopefully then we'll, we'll get some good news tomorrow. Anything else? Time in that meeting, where? Four o'clock? Four, four to five thirty. Or something else. Yeah, I think that's right. And then we're we'll running into the transition more. Yeah, still. We back back, 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 back. Yeah, yeah. Just making sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to see you in June? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Both of you. Yes. Oh, before I forget, um, I know that there's a whole lot of things that we have to do as a board, but um, one of the things that I would love for this board to do as a final act is to recommend to the yes. new board that. that we have student uh, participation. Yeah. Well, because yeah, the new cool. board isn't necessarily geared towards that thought, because there's a thousand other things that they're, they're gonna be thinking of, but this is the only board that truly has student representation on it. Mm -hmm. And if you guys could recommend it to yeah. the- And we actually talked to Lucy about that. I totally forgot about yeah, that. Yeah. We talked with Lucy about that, and she said, is there a way to get representation right. of a student from every you know, one of the five towns? And so, and it's a lot, I mean, as we all know, that's a lot for that to grab some boards. But I mean, statutes. you guys know the value, but people who've served on the elementary boards, it, it just may not be in their consciousness to, to think about. Yeah, Could I suggest that one of us draft a recommendation to bring to the next meeting? Good. One of us just recommend it? Uh, I'm we sure. Well, yeah. Once we get there, I mean. Yeah, we could do that once, you know, once we get there. Yeah. <laughs> We're, I'll I'll take care of getting them. You just yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's an excellent idea. I don't anticipate. Yeah, I, I don't think, think there'll be any problem with yeah, thinking about who's okay. Yeah, who's right. we'll just leave it but I just don't want us to forget. No. Right. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, like it's one of those. Things. Then, you won't let us. No, <laughs> well, they won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for writing. Much appreciated. Time to do that. Uh, uh, policy committee. Any report? No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and we'll move into the action agenda item. Approve the ESP contract for academic year 2019-2020 as negotiated by the negotiations committee. Carl. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. <laughs> I was right. I was making a note about student representation still. <laughs> we're, we're being asked to approve the ESP contract. Ah, yes. We like it. <laughs> Was that? Like sure. That? <laughs> <laughs> so the negotiation committee worked with the ESP associations um, and settled at a 3.5% increase. For, for a one-year contract, the same health changes as the teachers did, which changed it from 82-18 to 80-20, but also there wasn't any money change for the employee or the employer because we increased the amount of health care reimbursement account to 100% uh, coverage so that it would be easier on the paperwork for taking care of all the reimbursements. And um, there were there are some changes in recognizing public job positions, behavior interventionists, and personal care attendance, which we didn't have before. That's 
So 3.5%? 3.5%. Is there a motion to approve? I move that we approve. Second. Karen, questions? Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain? That passes. Then approve the non-bargaining contracts. So I would recommend to the board that this is for folks that are um, administrators, and then we have some admin assistance because of the information they have. They are not in the bargaining unit. And uh, so it's folks that supervise or are that, or admin assistants. For your administrators that are your assistant principals, principal, uh, associate. associate principal, I'm seeing Amy's position in my head. Director. Director, yeah, directors, that they receive 3.1% because they would be comparable to what the teacher's um, increase was. That our other uh, directors for buildings and grounds, food service, um, for those two because they supervise folks that are ESP, that they get the same increase as their ESP, the folks are supervising, which is 3.5. And that's, that, you've heard that other years from me. Okay. Is that clear? You want to make that motion? I'll, I'll move that. Carl? Right. I'll second. second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, that passes. Thank you. <laughs> Five point three approve hires. New hires. So on page twenty-four is a nomination for Brennan Lynch. Brennan Lynch uh, was a one-year faculty in the math department this year, um, filling in for Kate McCann, who has been on leave. Kate is returning. Uh, at the same time, uh, you approved Kendra Christiana's uh, resignation because she's moving last uh, meeting, and so we're just moving that you bring Brennan full time. This is a, this should be an easy one for us. Like she's been with us for a year, she's very good. She uh, and we want to make her full time um, permanent again. Yeah. And then there's a second one from Mark Brown. From Mark Brown who's been a one, was a one year while Alden was out on his uh, Roland fellowship, but you will see in a minute for accepting um, David Davis. Ready to nation, David Davis is moving on to another career opportunity. Yeah, essentially we're asking you to make our two one year appointments, permanent appointments for next year to fill in for two people who are leaving. It's a great It works out beautifully yeah. for them and for us. <coughs> So is there a motion to accept those two recommendations? Yeah, uh, we're not, uh, how many, how do I say this? <coughs> we're not actually approving it, we're just sort of. You have to approve it because they are yeah. licensed positions the board has to uh, recommend. I have to recommend. Right. For okay. non-licensure, I can go to hire. Uh-huh, thank you. I'll move it. Okay. Yes. I'll second. Second. Yes. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? And that passes. <coughs> and on page 25, we have the bids for the kitchen hood. The understanding is that uh, we need a new hood or we can't have a food service operation next year. That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. Unless you the health run will shut down the kitchen. <laughs> Looks like we received two bids, and one of them is quite a bit lower than the other. Yes. You yes. can imagine which one we want to award to would be the Alliance Mechanical bid for $93,982. We've done business with Alliance? Yes. yes. Use quite very we use both of those, Thomas and Alliance. Quite and that includes the whole system, the Ansel system, and all the Everything. Get in, get it out. Not an Kitchen. No. <laughs> <laughs> not an expensive, but it seems like there's a huge delta between the two. Bits. Yeah, sure is. Yeah. That's okay. almost like the other company didn't want the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes they take a chance that they're the only bidder. Uh, uh, yeah. There's also, we're at the time of year where you get big fluctuations. Yeah. Almost everyone's booked from now until the right. end of this calendar year. Really if you really, I mean, some of the other schools have talked about doing some things with their capital funds. I said, the guys, were. Can't, can't get somebody. Right it's too late. They're booked. So yeah. we were on the edge of this one wow. going out. Yeah. 
So there's a recommendation to approve the alliance bid. Is there a motion to accept that recommendation? So moved. Second. Karen? Should I put a dollar amount on that or no? That would be fine. You have ninety-three thousand nine hundred and eighty-two dollars. Nine hundred and what? Ninety-three thousand nine hundred and eighty-two. Any more discussion? All in favor say aye, please. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention. That passes. And then on page 26, we have a resignation for David Davis. That's correct. He's been with us for one year. Um, he moved here because his wife got a position in, um, in Vermont. From They moved from Colorado. They'll now be moving to New York City with, oh, wow. that, with their job change um, now. And so he's uh, regretfully resigning, but it was it, it, yeah. Oh, Trailing spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion to accept this resignation? Tell me. Yeah. What's the other Carl? Any discussion? <laughs> it doesn't ever work. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention. That passes. And there's no retirement. There's no retirement. Okay. <laughs> Is there a motion to approve the board orders? I had one question. Okay, can you just sure. show it for $49,152.98? You might need a signature or two on there. Okay. And a second for $150,725. Hoping it has the same thing. Yeah, 40 cents. Is there a motion? Yes, I have a bit. Scott? For a second? Sure. Also, I do want to ask the question. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, questions? I need to see them to remind myself what I was asking about. Can I ask my question? Sure, you asked. So there was a line item on there for Golden Corral. Yes. Yeah. For like a grand or something like a that. A grand trip okay. to Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Worst <laughs> meal you'll ever have. <laughs> Is it on the New Jersey uh, Turnpike? <laughs> no, it's coming out of DC. Um, oh, yeah. The kids love it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Ice cream. Oh, it is so rough. And then you get on the bus and you <laughs> let that sit there for, for uh, yes. days. <laughs> uh, the kids love it. So that's the eighth grade trip. My question was 11,290.25 to American Airlines. That would be the Ooh. Peru trip. Peru trip. And then the community bank line below it, the amount is off by 70 cents. It's, it's, it's 11,290.25 to American Airlines. It's 11,290.95 from community bank. I don't know. I can't help you on that. It's just it's something like a ball. Because it was a, because because it was a, a wire. It's a typo or you know, there was a little charge of, 70 cents or something. Could have been paid for a wire transfer, but I'd, I'd have to ask. I didn't yeah, ask I'm, sorry. Sorry. I'm, not, I'm not that worried about the 70 yeah. cents. I just thought I was curious. Yeah. <laughs> Any other discussion about the board orders? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? That passes. No. Did yeah, everybody sign it? If yeah. everyone signed it, that's not. that works to me. Yeah, um, too. Future agenda items. So we have a meeting in June. June 5th. June 5th, I believe, is the first Wednesday, which is going to be a carousel meeting. Oh, okay. With the SU and all the boards. Okay. As we have done the past three or four years. It's June 5th. So uh, let me get the exact date by looking at it. It's the first Wednesday, which is June yeah. 5th. So the theory is a shorter, shorter oh. meeting. Uh, we have one agenda item already. I'll, I'll bring some information about uh, the materials that we're using to help kids get into college yes. under the proficiency system. Because we actually have been doing some work on that. That's great. Um, may I also remind the board, um, June 14th, graduation, we always ask that you hold um, time before the graduation for the potential for an emergency meeting um, because we we have had uh, we haven't had my time here, so I we have had continue. But there has been a need for uh, an appeal by a family if their child is not able to graduate. Like I said, it hasn't happened while I've been here, so hopefully we're not going to have it this time either. Sometimes something happens on the senior trip. There's always that. 
Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it, it, can, it could be a disciplinary issue. It could be an academic issue. Um, we'll try to make, make sure that neither one of those happens, we'll and that you guys don't have to come. But just to remember that we hold that time before the graduation at five o'clock. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's. I would say four thirty. Four thirty. But I will make sure, Chris, that you get an appointment sent to you. Yeah. With that time, and so we know. usually have people come great. to the senior awards. Yes. If somebody will give Lucy her. Yeah, it's usually the chair does that. Oh. We'll send that I'll out. I'll be there that day. Not your mic. Not your mic. Perfect. No, that's true. You, you are already on the I need to be at the Montpelier graduation the same night, so I will not be here. We just need to. For, for the for, for diplomacy. For, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll or, I mean, I suppose I could run up here if we needed me for an emergency yeah. hearing. You know. But you want to know if, if board members can't be here. Les board. Leslie will coordinate okay. that. They're going to meet about graduation, so she'll send out a note about that for everybody. If you have a student you particularly want to handle yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, board communication. I think we can be pretty short and sweet with the next one. I'd be happy to draw something up. What do you want? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Great. Is there any other business? Did everyone right. get the newsletter? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're adjourned by, uh, by consensus at 7.48 p.m. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.